Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter number 3. We, we'll finish that today. There were three things. The ministry of John the Baptist to the general public, verse 1 through 6. The message, <clears throat> repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The second thing, verse 7 through 12, his message to the religious crowd, to the preachers, to the priests, to the leaders of the temple, to the scribes, the religious leaders. He starts out by calling them a generation of vipers. It's interesting that the most severe pointed words of John the Baptist and our Lord Jesus Christ and the Apostle Paul and the Apostles were to the religious leaders of the day. Because they were doing the most damage. They were doing the most damage. How many people today are trusting the words and sermons and books of religious leaders who have either watered down the gospel or it's no gospel at all? And we see that today almost daily on the television with the Pope of the Roman Catholic Church. How many people look at this man almost as God or as God. They look at him as God's representative and they trust everything he says. Well, let me just park there a minute and tell you, first of all, he doesn't even preach the gospel. Everything he's got to do is, everything he's got to say is about social ills. Climate warming, gang wars, the problems in the Middle East, the rich robbing the poor, social issues, legitimate issues, but that's not the gospel. The gospel is repent or perish. The gospel is for God to love the world and he gave his only begotten son. That's the gospel. Believe on Christ. Repent of your sins. Be saved. That's the gospel. That's not the message of the Pope or the Roman Catholic Church. Second problem is he is not God's representative. He is not. He and Mary are not the go-between God and the people. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He is, an, uh, the Pope is an imposter. Right. But millions, millions are looking to him. And folks, by looking to a man, they're going to bust hell wide open. Amen. Right. So the Lord's, John the Baptist, <coughs> Paul, the apostles, in the Bible, the most censorious, sharp words of warning <coughs> in the religious crowd. <coughs> and we certainly have that today. I had a man of Bible knowledge say to me, that's what I thought, say to me and say, well, you know, it really doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. <laughs> As long as you're not, as long as you believe in a higher deity and you have a personal code of conduct for your own life, you're going to go to heaven. How's that from the words of a preacher? Man. So we covered that last week, but I, I wanted to park there a few more minutes. So now we're going to get to the baptism of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 
Among other things, this is the inauguration of Jesus Christ to his public ministry. This is where it begins. Except for about, except for one incident at the age of 12, you've not heard much of anything about the Lord. He grew up like other kids, yet not like other kids. He grew in wisdom and stature. There is much about the childhood and the upbringing of the Lord Jesus Christ that is shrouded in silence and mystery. Now Mary, don't know anything about Joseph, because he soon went completely off the scene. We know they had other children. Modern false prophets are saying, well, he had been married before, and he had those kids by a previous marriage. No. There's no such thing in the Bible. The no. fact is, after Jesus was born, Joseph and Mary had a normal married life, and there were other children born in that union. When you find Mary in the first church, the church of Jerusalem, Acts chapter 1, she is there as one among that congregation, not one above that congregation. So all of a sudden here at about 30, Jesus comes to the baptism and, and begins his public ministry. Now the question and it's, it's one that's pretty easy to answer. Since Jesus was not a sinner, since Jesus knew no sin, since Jesus lived a sinless life, since, since Jesus did not need to be saved, therefore he did not need to be baptized. So why was he? Well, the answer, as you'll find in our text, is to fulfill all righteousness. You've got to remember... He took your sin and my sin. And this is the way that the Lord God Almighty chose to introduce him publicly. John in his ministry, in his baptism, was the star, little star of the day. And this was all in fulfillment of God's plan this was all in fulfillment of prophecy, and this was God's designated way to introduce him to the public. But did the Lord need to be baptized? No. Did the Lord have to confess sins? No. He was all man, but he's all God. Had there been any of those things, you and I would not have a Savior because without the shedding of blood is no remission of sins. And the only reason only His blood would do is because He's sinless. So the absurdity of man-made religions like the Catholic Church and others to claim and the church of Christ to claim that only their church can get you into heaven. Well, that's just bad. So the baptism of Jesus. Then cometh Jesus. Then, when? When John was baptizing in Jordan. When there were masses amounts of people there. When it was great public event when it was God's time when the Lord ordained this method at this time by John then see what well, sometimes there is one little bitty word you never would get it if you just kind of flew over then come with Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John uh, quite a journey quite a long journey Walk. I was reading some of these weekend in a quaint little quib. Uh, better to make the effort 
than to come short. Better to make the effort than to come short. Then Jesus cometh from Galilee to Jordan, and by the way, his human name, unto John to be baptized of him. Why? To fulfill righteousness, the plan of God. Notice here, but John forbade him, saying, I need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me. Now we've got to think about that a little. At this point, John, and I don't like the comparison, but you'll get it, he was the Billy Graham of the day. And what I mean is, uh, everybody knew him. He was famous. He was a big gun. He was a big preacher. Did that go to his head? I don't think so. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? <clears throat> he was still humble. Boy, that's hard for us. Oh, man, sometimes the worst thing in the world can happen to us is a little success. I mean, we get the big head. Look what we're doing! By the way, what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Nothing. Nothing. John was still humble. And, and notice what he said. I have need to be baptized of thee. He was dealing with the souls of others, but he was still aware of the needs of his own life. He was still aware of the need of the Lord in his own life. God help us to remember that. Especially those of us who serve others. Help us to remember we also have a soul. We also have needs. We're not doing anything that God doesn't help us to do. We're nothing without Him. Help us to stay humble and let us not get beyond the point where we think we're somebody and we don't need any help. No, uh, comest thou to me? And Jesus said unto him, <coughs> Suffer me. Well, Lord, let's, let's do this. Let, it, it needs to be. Suffer it. By the way, I will stop with that word, suffer. It's one of those archaic English words that uh, has so much of that in the King James Bible that people are using as an excuse to write newer translations, and it's a weak one. It's as weak as water. It's because we don't want to study. We don't want to dig. We don't want to look it up. We don't want to have a dictionary by it to look up what a word may mean. But first of all, it's a, it's a subtle attack of Satan to dilute the Word of God. And I always like to tell the story of the late Charles Haddon Spurgeon who preached out of the King James Bible. He preached to 4,000 people three times a day, every Lord's Day. And he did not have the rich and the famous. He had the sinners, he had the laborers, he had the farmers, he had the uneducated, and nobody had a problem with the King James Bible. That's right. And in case you don't want to go back that far, I happen to know that Dr. Criswell, until the last few years when he went to a new King James, preached out of the King James Bible. And I happen to know to the day he resigned, because he was dying of cancer, that Adrian Rogers preached out of this identical Bible, like I'm preaching of. And this church grew when he took that church after R.G. Lee. They had about 3,000 people coming. And when he resigned, they had 17,000 people coming. So don't tell me. Don't give me the con job that people can't understand the King James Bible. It's not, this is not the problem. This is the problem. Amen. So people ask me, what will Bible be for job? King James. Can't fool an old fool of King James. Jesus answered and said unto him, Suffer it to be so now. This was the time. This was the time. Now. I told you before, now is the time for this church. 
Now is the time. Today is the time. Today we are going to uh, preach the gospel to lost people. Today, this is the day. Today is the time. Suffer to be so. Now, never mind tomorrow. Today is the time. For thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Ours is a righteous cause, folks. Our church has a righteous cause. The Lord and His Word and the salvation of souls. How dare anybody look down on us? How dare people belittle us because we're small? No. Now is the time. It comes us. It becomes us. It's needful. We must do it. Now is the time to fulfill all righteousness. So then he suffered him. See, the Lord accepted John's humility, but he did not accept his refusal. By the way, humility that refuses is not really humility, yep. is it? Then he suffered him. One of the hardest things that we all have to deal with, including me, maybe especially is when we do something wrong, we say something wrong, and somebody comes and talks to us about it. God help us to be gracious. God help us to be willing to admit I made a mistake. Amen. You're right. I'm wrong. I know it's really easy to say, oh, you messed up. It's a lot harder to say, I messed up. It's really easy to say, you've sinned. It's real hard for me to say, I have sinned. But God help us as believers. To be humble like John. Yeah. I mean the greatest preacher of the day, but he had to eat a little crow there. He had to admit, I, I was wrong. Let's do this. God help us to have that spirit. And by the way, if we keep that spirit in our churches, there never will be any more problems. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. <coughs> uh, There, we don't do this anymore, but there used to be years ago in the olden days after baptisms, while people were still in the water, they testified. And then come out of the water. It was a custom. Jesus didn't need to do that. He didn't have any sin to confess. There wasn't any uh, change in his life other than he's beginning his public ministry. There was no reason for him to stay in that water. He did immediately come out of the water. Oh, and by the way, while we're at it, let's go ahead and throw a real Baptist a statement in there. Baptism is immersion, Amen. not sprinkling. Yep. He went down into the water. He came up out of the water. Did you know that when, when, when they translated the word of God into English, there was no word for baptize. There wasn't such a word. The Greek word was baptizo. It means to put under. And so they changed, they dropped the Greek ending and put an English ending on it and changed baptizo to baptize. So, us Baptists are real sticklers about baptizing. Matter of fact, the, the, the gentleman that trained me, I was so blessed to be able to uh, uh, work full time in a large church all through seminary. And uh, the senior pastor of the church weighed over 400 pounds. He was quite immobile. One of the things he could no longer do was get in the baptistry. I don't mean to be funny, but when he when he got in, the water got out. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, they put you know, fine. So I did all the baptizing. You like that, Mike, didn't you? So I did all the baptizing, and oh, he was a stickler. If you <coughs> don't have the last hair on their head, under the water, it's not Baptist baptism. <laughs> and 
time or two, caught me fudging. He made me do it over in front of the whole crowd. Yeah. But he was right. He was right. You're a new creation. You're, you're a new creation, not part of the new old. All of your sins are forgiven. Yeah. So when Jesus came straight up out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him. I want you to know it was heavens. There is the atmosphere of heaven, that's right above you, that's what you breathe. There and there is the starry heavens, which is above that. Uh, by the way, may I remind you of Psalms 116, 15. God said, the earth hath he given unto the children of men, but the heavens he has reserved for himself. I've told you this before. I'll tell you again, I don't think we got any business going up. I'm somewhat narrow-minded about their motives. I think their motives of going up there are no better than the Tower of Babel. And that was to go up there and see if God's really up there. Hmm. You either didn't get it or you don't care. I didn't get it. Well, I think... I think the scientists want to go up there and prove that God's not there. Oh. <laughs> yeah. That's what it's about. Yeah. Straight out of the water, the heavens were opened unto him. I think this was more, obviously, since it's plural, this is more than just the atmosphere of heaven. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. This is the heaven's public coronation of Jesus Christ to begin his earthly public ministry. <clears throat> That's what this is. Now the Spirit of God came on him, and you know he had the Spirit of God without measure. Like a dove. First of all, the only bird that was allowed to be a sacrifice, his blood was allowed to be shed under the Levitical priesthood, was only one bird that was a dove. So the dove was the only fitting emblem to come on the Lord to signify the power of the Holy Spirit for the shedding of our Lord's blood. Secondly, there was so much about the dove that represented the Lord harmless. Harmless is a dove. The dove was the bird that brought a green twig in her mouth to the ark that was safe for them to come out. The Lord Jesus Christ brings to us the message of peace. Yeah. Isn't it sad? It's heartbreaking. We are seeing, I, I, I don't know how, I, if you've noticed, but most of my TV watching is the news, and that's not much. But if I can, I, I get home to watch the news, and then use I turn it off and study. I had to watch Christmas movie now on the Hallmark Channel, like I guess most of y'all are doing. And those are good movies. Those are movies a Christian can watch and really enjoy. But uh, after the same uh, Bernardino situation, and of course Paris, and, and other things, and these attacks that are increasing all the time, I tell you what, men don't have the answer. A lot of talk, a lot of discussion, a lot of propositions, but men don't have the answer. We do. They're not going to be any peace. See, all these problems, the problem is sin. That's the problem. The problem is sin. The answer is Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. And nothing sort of things are going to continue to get worse. The Lord said in Matthew 24, difficult times, troublesome times, murder, war will increase and increase and increase until Jesus stops it. And they will not have Jesus. We will not have this man reign over us, is what the Jews said at the first coming of Jesus. And that's the way it's going to be till Jesus comes back again. The dove 
lighted upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven. The Holy Spirit came in the form of a dove. God came in the form of a voice. And I want you to notice here in this verse is the first clear, easy, one, two, three, proof of the Trinity. You have God the Father in heaven talking. You have the Spirit coming on Jesus, and you have Jesus Christ coming out of baptismal water. Amen. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit prophesied in various ways and predicted and insinuated all over the Old Testament. But here, finally, you have it. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. I want you to know this. This is my beloved Son, the mediator, the son of the covenant, God's beloved Isaac, the son, the mediator, the high priest, the covenant keeper, agreeing with the Father for the redemption of us. My beloved son. I want you to notice something else. In whom I am well pleased. I want you to notice in. See, these modern translations, they've messed up so much that people don't right. get this. But right. notice, this is my beloved son in. Not by, but in. What does that mean? That means every one of us that are in Christ, we are beloved of the Father just like Jesus Christ. When we're saved, we're put <coughs> into Christ. And when God sees us, He doesn't see us. He sees His beloved Son, and He loves us just like His beloved Son. Amen. In whom I am. Well, please. Now, there's the human side and there's the divine side. The divine side, we're in Christ, and the Lord is well pleased. But there is a human side of responsibility. Are we living, serving, is our journey here in this life something that the Lord could say, I'm well pleased? I hope so. That's good. I pray so. Amen. It's an ongoing work. Yeah. And now the Lord begins his public ministry. Now, I'm going to stop there. It's almost time anyway. Um, because I have something out of chapter 4, verse 1, in my introduction to my uh, message this morning. And so I, I really, that's why I want to stop. But it's about the time that I'm going to stop anyway. So God bless you for being here.